So, hello everyone. Um, am I audible? Okay, if so, we can start now. Um, today I will be leading the session for uh, ML of signed out or email. Um, so let's start then. <laughs> can you see my screen? Okay, let me start. But if you have any question, as if I didn't see the writing on the messaging panel, so you can unmute and ask any question if you have. Uh, rather than that, I could start with my presentation. So basically, today what we will going to talk about is how how we can build the. Uh, machine learning systems and pipelines, basically, which is similar to the traditional way of uh, developing software, but a much more uh, an improved version to adopt the new ML of uh, machine learning needs. Uh, so basically, uh, previously, how we think as a, when we think of this system is as a holistic approach, which will analyze the whole system constitute and parts that interrelate with the system and how they work together, then basically that forms a large context of system. So in previous ways, we will think of systems like software systems, like a linear process, which means uh, just it have certain starting point plus uh, it have certain ending point like we will have a requirement gathering step then based on that requirement we will try to think the all possible solutions and we will try to design that then once that design is completed the actual implementation will go through uh, for this specific problem then based on that we will have a certain solution but there is a problem with this uh, Sorry, Mahalit, there is sound behind. Um, uh, what about now? Is that clear now? A little bit good, but it, there is echo behind, which reflects your sound. Like. Echo. Maybe maybe I will try to maximize my voice then. Uh, so uh, what I was talking is about the traditional way of system thinking, which we think of like a system have its own starting and ending point, where that means uh, we, we define as a linear process. Uh, when we think of this uh, traditional thinking, uh, there are certain limitations because recently software needs to be updated uh, and requirements are changed while you are working on a certain project. Let's say developing a project will take a one year project. So uh, once you are starting to define the problem and requirement plus every necessary details, you will take the all six months, let's think of that. And at the end of that one year, uh, you will de de deliver a certain product, but that product might not meet the, uh, the actual business objective when, or may need to be modified. So in that sense, you need to adopt new change and your system should have to be adaptable for dynamic change, so static way of building systems is not feasible nowadays. So we need to come back to the modern thinking, which includes like 
the project's complexity, it deep dives to the project complexity, it checks everything, it, it allows you this agile methodology of system development. And that means like if while you are working in, in certain functionality, if the requirement is changing, so based on that, you'll need to adapt and you'll need to talk to your customer. You have MVP, that MVP is a showcase for your client, then based on that, you'll build on top of it. That means uh, your client's also satisfied and you are also delivering the exact product that the business needs. So basically, uh, in recent ways, uh, or in modern approach, we will follow this uh, methodology as a system development. Uh, basically, when we think of this uh, modern way of thinking, we, need, we have a process, then a workflow, then task. So we will break down into a certain uh, different functionality then. Uh, so when we talk about process, we have a certain process to develop an ML product. So maybe my intention was to develop a machine translation model for a certain language for English. Then I have a certain requirement, so I will put that requirement into, uh, I will write it down and I will break it down into certain processes. Then those process will be performed and I will deliver a one machine learning model which can accept uh, an English text and translate it to let's say for to French then that's the whole complete process but when we think of workflow this is much more of uh, iterative process and it can be deep as um, it says because uh, we need to break down uh, this workflow is into a, a single process, so that can be manageable and easily easy to monitor and deliver. So basically, uh, you can think of workflow as a set of process, and that needs to be uh, that leads you to easily automate, easily manage, and uh, you can have a repeatable across different situations, like a repeatable code across different situations and you can minimize the uh, wastage of this resources that we call it as many or time then the agile framework which we use as a modern software development uh, approach which is like you will provide a single mvp per uh, workflow let's say you have to develop this ML um, model, you need to have uh, a single translation model that shows how your system works. And based on that, if your company have another need, you will adjust that uh, MVP to, to adapt the new scenario. Then uh, if you need uh, to test the stress test uh, or to scale, or if you want to deploy that one, just once having this, uh, uh, Develop model is not a lot, is not easy to uh, integrate to the development uh, the production environment. So your de development and production environment seems to be similar, and also maybe your production environment needs additional um, uh, resource like CPU or network bandwidth, anything which you need to scale your project. So. In, a, in that way, you need to test in each MVP phase, then you will go through adapting the new chains and changing your perception from simply delivering a machine translation model to machine trans delivering machine translation model that will work and that is minimized, uh, that have minimum risk when it goes to production that will allow many people to use. And you can think of many requirements there uh, according to the business need. And also, as much as you can, you the time is the valuable resource which we are well developing the systems. So we need to uh, consider about this time issue also. Uh, maybe most of uh, the software background trainees may have this high level overview of the uh, system development life cycle, but maybe I will go through 
uh, the high level overview just as a start you can start with the initial idea then you will go for the feasibility study whether this idea is feasible to be implemented in terms of resource operations what you have then the require what are the basic business requirement and based on that business requirement you will go for the system analysis how you can implement this one into a software environment then uh, that need that needs even if that meets the requirement analysis which you have earlier and you will cross check those things then based on that you will have a software specification and you will start to design the system then development plus testing then implementation then as you know software needs based on uh, the change it needs maintenance and some kind of review for new change so this is a circular process uh, which we will go through in every machine learning or any software development process so um, the next part is how we can manage and control this process uh, in each phase of this the sdls sdlc phase we need a project definition requirement definition system requirement definition analysis and design then you'll build that system and you'll prototype and show to the uh, that meets whether that meets the business objective or not in each phase you have to verify in each phase you have to consult your uh, management and the actual the project owners should have to participate in this process so this is not one time process as the as we know the waterfall or any iterative process needs uh, to be iteratively check and change you need to check and balance what you have on your uh, software system requirement so in order to automate this we have the structural operation part which we call as ops and this is uh, that will uh, have the operational organization which leads to the, the infrastructure and the process owner to organize their what they have for this specific project and uh, system level operational applying this to the principle of the software development cycle plus uh, what's the uh, different outcomes that we expect and as we go through this process we need to have minimum interruption and frictionless uh, operation so based on that we will come up to the devops concept which is to have a self-enabling system or self-enabling team that means every uh, developer will allow to work independently but they have the standardized tool and the standardized process management uh, definition let's say the way you define uh, you are working on the machine learning development the way you define uh, variables functions and those things needs to be standardized according to that specific project or that company then uh, you need to use maybe you need to use git uh, to push your code and commit what you have and also uh, that will help the other developer to start based on what you have and rather than going through uh, another additional work to what to perform the task you have done earlier and to integrate this one and everyone if everyone have <coughs> certain main branch let's say how we you can use this kit we have a main branch and development branch and everywhere we extend that one and if you have certain feature update so you will go to that specific um, branch and extend that one plus you will add your future then you will push it that will make it easier if everyone have common ground to start and so this devops will lead you to this minimum interruption and fractionless operation in throughout your development process then 
the last thing while you have been done the project or the task, you complete everything, but uh, you need to deploy that one to be productionized and to be used by the end users. So how can we do? Uh, maybe there are certain um, version mismatch issues and so many issues are there. So in order to manage that one, the other option is also using uh, shipping um, tools for developers like Docker or containerization tools. So that will standardize the environment in your local machine plus in your uh, external machine on server or the cloud. So basically, we have this three basic advantage of DevOps. Like you will, when you have a, a clear and structured DevOps team, then you, you will shorten the development life cycle and you will increase the deployment velocity because um, you have a certain code structure. And if you integrate that um, SCI CD, then that will be another plus side so every every whenever everyone push so it will go integrate to the main branch or the development branch then it will deploy it then that becomes much more frequent and it's helpful to test to check each feature in face by face and also this dependable production release so basically to have this DevOps principle, there are certain tools which we use, the Docker one, Jenkins, GitHub Actions, uh, Kubernetes, more and more are there. But to achieve the DevOps task, we have just two principles. That means the continuous integration plus continuous delivery. As I have talked earlier, continuously when certain changes are there, you will integrate that one to your maybe uh, development branch. Then continuous delivery leads to deployment. So uh, each and every feature that you have pushed will be deployed uh, through the CICD principle. So when we come back to the ML ops or uh, ML system specifically, we will think of, we will have three major components, the data engineering part and the machine learning or the modeling part plus the deployment or the app engineering part. Uh, so in order to integrate these three parts, we have uh, we need to have a certain pipeline, uh, which is similar to our, uh, the previous software development um, process. But uh, when we come to the ML engineering part, uh, we treat this um, each uh individual component as they have and they they have their own process and workflow and pipeline uh, let me go through uh, this as an MLOps, you have similar position with the devops one or similar definition with the devops however you will in this case you will deal with machine learning models so uh, you have a machine learning team which can develop the model, then they will train and operationalize the model. Then based on that, they have, maybe you will have iterative development process because uh, in one go, you didn't get the result you want. So you have continuous training, continuous training. Then in this, through this continuous training process, you need to register your artifacts, your uh, model parameters into somewhere else. Then those from that one, the best model will be selected and that model will be deployed. In that sense, then you will have the predictive serving then continuous monitoring. So when you have this role, uh, the model deployment will need uh, certain deployment knowledge, so the mod the artifacts and the model parameters should have to be passed to the final model result deployment. Yes, then the continuous monitoring should be uh, checked for tests for um, 
details of the actual model and it's actually predicting us it was doing in the experiment phase so we need to check and continuously monitor the ml models in this environment so basically we have <coughs> those three components i talked earlier so the, the, the data part is the one which you use them to collect data, then verify feature engineering, you will do that uh, for as a data part, then that data will be um, passed to the ML team, then the ML team starts to feature engineering and analyze the data. Based on that, they will select the model and start to create the machine learning model. And that will lead to the model analysis, how it is performing, how it's uh, doing the expected task or not. Then based on that, you will need another issue is resource while you are training it this ML. So um, you need to have a proper um, resource management option. Let's say you have thousands and thousands, thousands of data then you need to train that one, but you have limited resource in terms of computing. Uh, so how do you manage that one? That is also another um, issue which you need to consider. And also how do you manage the process uh, the, while developing this ML models? Then based on that, you will have the serving infrastructure, whether you will like you have built certain ML system, and then how do you serve that one to the end user? Maybe you have to build another app or a website that hosts your model, or you need to create um, an inbuilt uh, models that you can serve your ML models and ready to use. Or maybe you can deploy that one to, you can serve it through the mobile apps so you need to decide and you need to have the consideration while you deploy your ml models into which, which platform should i have to deploy this one and where should i have served and how i have served and what are what type of resource constraints do i have and what are the things which we i need to do before deploying and before serving this one to the public and also monitoring is the other part you should have to monitor how it's performing and every time you need to test you need to check and so basically the ml ops workflow will look like like this uh, you have the ml development which starts from the data modeling and data management then <coughs> you have the training and the personalization in this case, you have the your code and the configuration files that, for example, your model development configuration files, including the uh, epochs, uh, parameters, and the, the things which you will, you will use to develop that models and the training pipeline. Uh, because as I have told you, this is an iterative process. You need to train more and more, more, more time to get the best result. Then based on that, uh, the continuous integration will be um, start. So in this phase, you need to register each and every uh, training <coughs> result. So for that, we have different alternative tools which we can integrate, like a 1DB, uh, <coughs> And ML flow, and you can integrate that one to what you have, then they will register the artifact plus the current uh, what you have in your model as a result, as a parameter, and also your loss, everything, error. Uh, then based on that, you will select the uh, best performing model, then you will go for deployment. And once you have packaged and everything is ready to go, so you will have the serving and serving needs to have a log, which will log everything and continuous monitoring 
based on how your model is performing and what are the things you need to check um, or if there is anything which needs uh, manual intervention you have to act as early as possible because the baby sometimes you know they expect what comes so you need to verify and check every time mm, so this MLOps capability will give us the reliable and scalable plus secure system or infrastructure in our overall ML uh, projects. So if we deploy the proper uh, MLOps steps, we will get reliable system and secure system that, that will be scalable for the future use. Uh, so the ML development process looks like this. I have attached the slides on your drives and you can check that one. Maybe I would go for the demo may, uh, before that, maybe if I get question. Yeah, I have shared the PowerPoint. So you can access from uh, day to uh, Tuesday drive. So basically, when we come back to the actual implementation or how, how we can um, implement that we have talked earlier and in a real life scenario, so we will take just two um, use cases. The first one is the uh, topic modeling, and the second one is sentiment analysis. Uh, basically, both of them are from natural language processing task, and we have used the tutor dataset to analyze sentiment and to model the topic. And as let me explain first the idea behind topic modeling plus sentiment analysis. Uh, topic modeling is a kind of like uh, by itself, it's an unsupervised machine learning task and it doesn't have any label and any predefined way of thinking. But uh, we will use this one as to classify texts based on their topic, or we can use this as a future engineering in our ML process. So you can have, there are a certain words and you, you, you want to analyze what this words or this text is about and you will model uh, that one. This topic modeling will lead you to discover the abstract topic that uh, occurred in the collection of texts that means uh, I have a bunch of texts or comments which are collected from Twitter. Then I just want for those specific topics which is talked about in Academy. So I need to model that one in a way. And those those models um, will use the uh, collection of texts which I collected from the Twitter. Then I will model them to I will have to pass them to into this pre-processing phase, then removing every unnecessary things like emojis or anything that used to bias my model. Then based on that, if I remove all the things and most sometimes you don't use this stop words, which is redundant words in Marshall um, in English, maybe you have is an a, uh, they have more document frequencies than the rest of the actual the work in academy. So I need to remove those things before I have to do the processing, the pre-processing. So once I done this pre-processing task, I will have to model the how this model can appear, how the topics are models for me, and uh, which is the better way to model my specific text collection to topic. This is the questions which we need to answer. And then throughout this demo, we will use uh, pandas, and by 
by Davis uh, libraries to train and plot all the topics which we get from the uh, text cluster which we have. And when we come back to the sentiment analysis, uh, it's a kind of um, a monitoring tool just to know whether your customer is satisfied or not. So based on what you provided, and whether you give a service or product. So people may put their opinion there. Based on that opinion, you will classify them as good, uh, positive, negative, or neutral. Then based on that, you will react on the negative ones and you will maximize your positive uh, feedbacks. So it's kind of uh, feedback management. And uh, so basically the first thing is first, you need to know your data. You need to understand your data, what are the data requirements and how you uh, you are using them. So as I have told you, we we are taking these two examples from natural language processing. So we need a natural language processing library support libraries like Genzim or you can use NLTK in this case. And from data organization perspective, you can use Panda. Then for plotting uh, purpose, I have used uh, Matplotlib and Seabor. So uh, I just started loading data from my drive, then the data is in my drive. So I have to load that one. So as if I'm doing this um, collab, so I have used the collab G drive mount uh, function, then I have defined this data loader class that loads the, from the directory which I have and the file name which I have given to the class. Then based on that, I have the data which looks like this. And when it, you can see this, it's it looks like messy and so many um, things are there. So I need to go to specific one, which I want for this specific problem. So my problem I have stated, I just, I want to model uh, or I want to cluster the tweets into a certain, into 10 topics. And then, and also I have to, I classify the sentiment into either positive and negative based on the uh, text which I have. So I will use this clean take, uh, the original text plus sentiment. And for text cleaning purpose, I have used this class, just a standard way of uh, processing, pre-processing text like removing this unwanted emojis, everything, just converting everything to string as if um, I, I want to work on a string, so I need to convert those things into a string, then uh, I just want to minimize my model error rate, so I have removed all the punctuation marks inside the text. Then, this is kind of a basic tree processing. So I have this one. Then from the vectorization perspective, I have used the uh, document uh, ID to document mapping or from the bug of word model from the NLTK, which we create the ID and frequency. Yeah, ID and frequency. Uh, when we deal with strings uh, or any kind of um, NLP task, or as you know, computer can understand what zeros and ones only. So we need to convert everything into numbers. And based on that number, you have to map, uh, you have to have the word to ID mapping plus the word ID to frequency mapping as a kind of a future engineering for this specific task. So I have used the term document frequency, term frequency and inverse document frequency here. Then you have so many um, libraries which you can extend them and you can pass the word list which you have and they will convert it that to whatever uh, methodology which you want. Then I have the 
add it to world mapping and each word which in my uh, word list will be counted and placed into as you can see like double and based on that i will start to model uh, the as you see i have passed the pre-processing pass then i have passed the future engineering part which is the conversion of this strings to number and vectorizing then and the next step is modeling um, while i am modeling i use the LDA model, which is based on this distributional hypothesis. And you can read more about the LDA model, how it can work for your further information. But you can use uh, the GNSM LDA model and you will specify your need based on what you want. So in this case, I have to uh, divide the corpus into five topics. So this will look at my words and my topic. And based on that, it will pick up the five representative topics for the existing, um, from the existing corpus. And from that corpus or text to it, which I have collected, it will start to uh, classify into those specific uh, topic lists. So the most uh, near to that topic, the word that's most near to that topic will be categorized under that one. Maybe let's say if you take, like this one is for the climate, climate, climate change. And the first, the first topic is related to the climate change, how it's likely. And the second one is from the monetary our account perspective. And the third one is about mid UK and carbon emission rate from the government. So based on that, it will try to uh, classify uh, in this, um, based on their probability, it will categorize into five categories. Mm -hmm. Then you will get this one as a result. So uh, you are the one who decide uh, this is our uh, this is my final result or I need to fine tune or to check another topics and you can increase the number of topics you can increase uh, the way you represent your words you can use this uh, um, the most recent um, um, word embedding models like what to big or bird or any of them you can like play with this hyper parameters and you will get better results. This is just for the demo purpose. Then the next thing is how I, how it does your model is performing. How do you know whether it's good or bad? How do you measure that one? Uh, it's accurate or not? So you need to like for this topic model specifically, we have the complexity measure. So we will uh, measure that complexity and uh, an LDA coherence model or the model coherence model. So you will have that as as well. And as you can see from the perplexity perspective, it's negative six and it's perplexity, which is represented in terms of negative value and the more lower value is better value. That means this model is not performing good uh, from the LDA coherence model, we get the 60.61 point, and this seems reasonably working, but still needs to be it's below half. So we need to uh, do more and more on this one. And uh, from the visualization perspective, you can visualize them um, this file LDVs. So that will use the, the model which we trained earlier and it shows you the model and everything which you have and it's much more interactive when this is topic one result, this is topic two, this is topic five. And you can see and visualize 
when you are providing reporting to this one, this is much better way to show your results because um, sometimes uh, if you say accurately 0 0.5 or 0 0.6, it doesn't mean nothing, but if you show how it's accurate, how, how it's performing, and if you show the result in visualized way, that's much better. So this is it from the topic modeling perspective. So where we can use this topic modeling? Uh, we can use in many places, um, but in ML, most of the heavy ML production, we will use this topic modeling as a feature engineering step by itself, not as a modeling or one of the model. And when I come back to the sentiment analysis, uh, we will go through sentiment. So basically, sentiment you will have either positive, negative, or neutral. And this is identified from the text which you have kept. And this is much more very valuable for the online things which you have. Like if you have online shopping, online trading, online, and something like online training in academy have, and you need to get what people saying about this specific training and are they happy or not? you need to answer. So based on in that case, you will use the sentiment modeling. I have used the same data, but for this data, I don't have a specific um, sentiment uh, labels that says either it's positive or negative. So I need to go and check the polarity of that specific um, text Then the subjectivity, considering this polarity and subjectivity. I will try to predict uh, the sentiment either it's positive or negative. So I have gone through some manual regeneration of this uh, positive label and negative label. Mm. As you can see here, I have used a certain threshold. Uh, like if this is strong positive, then I will use the polarity is greater than 0 0.5. And this is some of the internal details. Well, when you go through it, you will you will understand how this works. Then once I have the labels, so I will select the like my specific ultimate goal is to predict sentiment or to train a model that predicts sentiment that accepts text and says either it's positive or negative. So I have to select those two columns necessary for me. That means the clean text uh, and the label. Then based on that, I could plot simple plots, which I have. Maybe here you can draw a word cloud or other sort of showing what you have in your textual data. Then that will be um, that will give you much insight about your data, and you know your data well. From here, as you can see, like I have seven, uh, forty-seven percent of negative sentiment text and forty-one percent of neutral text and eleven percent of positive text. Uh, in actual machine learning sense, this is not a balanced data because uh, the neutral and negative data are much higher than the uh, positive one, so uh, we need to balance and go through other balancing mechanism just from the data perspective before we go into modeling. Then we have this um, hugging face pre-trained models uh, for sentiment, or let's say hugging face provides more models for each and every language and for most of the models you can you have the option to upload also if you think of they are good models and in terms of natural language if you think of natural language processing task or if you think of it's a computer vision task you have a model you have a data set you can use you can reuse and even much more like as you can see there are uh, 300, uh, 300k plus models are there and you can have uh, more more and more data from here also 
the models are pre-trained and much uh, experimented. You know, you can see, as you can see, this this one is for video diffusion model card, and there are. If I search for uh, sentiment. Like this is one of the sentiment model which we have in the hugging face, so you can you know how to use, and you can see the evaluation result here, and how it is working. So this is a much easier way, or you can use this one. This is the predefined transformer library which you can extend it to your code and you start by passing the name and the classifier just you will get the the actual model which they have trained based on that you will train your own uh, they have different um, language support uh, this is different from model to model but you will get more 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 and more multilingual models that have um, multiple language support from the hugging face so you can check from there mm. then one db is the other one which i have used here from the in order to register or to facilitate my auto and um, my experimenting process because as we go or if you are the one who developed the machine learning model you will forget the parameters. You will, you don't even you don't you cannot remember the parameters you have used earlier for and after next run, and you will forget the result. So, in order to minimize that one, you will have this uh, one DB uh, automation tool, which will help you uh, to organize your runs or your experiments into a way that will be accessible in your future because I have run three models. So I have three different versions. So based on that version, I will get the result which I have run. Uh, what are my CP utilization, my disk utilization information related to accuracy. If I registered those things and number of runs which I run. And as you can see, this one is only registering one accuracy rate. But if I have multiple epoch, multiple hyperparameter tuning, so it will start to register that one into multiple charts, and this will be much easier to report for you. Also, to go, to know the what are what's the difference between the first run and the second run, and how you can uh, maximize the uh, accuracy you want to get, and what are the things which you need to. Uh, overcome through this process and this will be much more helpful for you to when you go to the production so you know exactly how much network traffic does it want how much disk utilization does it have and everything which you need to deploy this from development to deployment it will be registered every experiment so that will be helpful for you and uh, when you progress this um, development model to production. Then based on that, we have the, the clean text and label. <clears throat> then you will go for using this uh, transformer pipeline and there are different mechanisms which you report your um, modeling result including the AUC curve, accuracy, confusion matrix. Uh, so, <clears throat> so as you can see, I have from the pipeline modules, transformer pipeline module, I have extended the sentiment analysis model and I have loaded all the models, the tokenizers, and each configuration for its vocabulary, which are necessary for the text classification tasks. And based on that, I will try to evaluate <coughs> the prediction. Uh, so from the 
prediction or from the model which I train in this uh, specific custom data, I get uh, 68 percent accuracy, which is um, the number of correctly predicted plus uh, over the total uh, prediction. So based on that, you can define your acceptable measure, then whether you accept this specific accuracy or not, or if not, you have to go and you have to go back and fine tune the model by from the apart from the default configuration to your configuration. Then <clears throat> this is another way of reporting your accuracy rather than using this accuracy. You can have <clears throat> a confusion matrix that tells you which one is the actual positive or predictor as actual positive plus the actual negative predictor as actual negative and your <coughs> error rate you can see that <coughs> your error rate in this one because the as you you would see my model is not working good because <coughs> The actual negative uh, prediction is higher than the predicted negative uh, result. So that's the problem. So we need to fine tune the model. We need to take additional measures on this one. Um, then the other implementation which shows you the 1db implementation you have to register for 1db uh, legend bias uh, interface once you register on that one they will give you an access key then you will organize your runs there you can display you can check you can see everything which you have trained under the sweat and the bias so as you have seen, I have used the transformer <coughs> return sentiment model. There are different model sentiment models, so you can extend one of them. Then based on that, I have calculated the, ca the accuracy which I want. So as you can see, I should I can monitor the running result everything in the 1db so this will be much more helpful while you production like the ML model development uh, <coughs> and i've put some of the reference here you can check and if you have any questions let me know maybe let me stop my presentation here Okay, go ahead. David, I think you can go. Maybe if there is no one. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, it's a very impressive and interesting presentation. Um, like very interested what I uh, presented. But uh, I have one question and one comment. If uh, if <coughs> data was collected from Twitter, which is one source of data or one kind of data. So uh, during machine learning, uh, machine learning uh, process, the challenging task or challenging uh, so the machine learning was data quality issue or data processing issue. So under data uh, quality or data processing issue, if you face or uh, like data sources different from other like uh, textual data with image data or other kind of data how do you uh, going to feed or integrate this kind of data if if you have uh, like happen this kind of problem how do you pass uh, and 
the next one is the challenges that you are going to face to, to develop uh, starting from the data collection to the model development what are the challenges and how do you pass could if you uh, share us it's very interesting mm -hmm. okay so uh, data uh, the first question is about data quality so when we think of data quality we are um, <coughs> Machine learning models can and development can be categorized into these three phases. So the data preparation and data modeling is another line which needs to be uh, curated and triangulated from different data sources. I have, as I have shown, I have used only the Twitter one. But like, uh, if you think of the academy, we have different social media, so we need to collect data from that, and we need to verify those data plus you need to work into the data quality assurance that that's another line of task which you, you are expected to do while you are uh, doing this machine learning model so when you come to production so this is the other person's task and as a machine learning engineer you will get the data so you you know you are expected to have um, and a solution that needs uh, that meets the business requirement plus uh, based on the data that they have given to you and if you need additional data you you need to ask then they have to create that one or they have to translate they have to search <coughs> so uh, no one is doing this one independently so you have different data quality measures you need to follow as a company or as uh, project owner and from the challenge uh, there are so many challenges as you started from the data quality the first one and the models are not uh, doing as expected when you they comes to production because the people are, can interact people can abuse them if they are online models so you need to have that one as uh, you have you have a data protection mechanism because uh, as you know machine learning models can lead to different direction because you have let's say you have chat gpt and this is a pre-trained language model and you are asking something you will ask that one and based on that it will return a certain result then you will call it she knows that every, every time when you ask the model uh, people are correct than her so that means you you are you will ask you know, how, what's the result of one plus one then she will return two and you will in the second conversation this you will tell her this is not correct so one plus one should have to be three so this kind of model <coughs> abuse can happen while you develop the emotional translation model or while you develop any sentiment model and maybe that the things which needs an actual conversation with the model so you need to be careful in protecting your algorithms not to be vulnerable <coughs> to this kind of situations maybe if i'm getting your point yeah. thank you very much yeah i understood I have shared, I think I have seen some comments. Um, I have shared the examples and the notebook to the, in your drive, so you can use that as a reference. Uh, is there any question? Maybe we can discuss or uh, 
Rodas hover safe. True. Sure. Okay. Thank you, everyone. So we can wrap up the session here and see you tomorrow.